Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle, and we are here to help you sound smarter when talking to your friends. And this is a special series called The Path to Libertarianism. As I was explaining to our guest, Jason Pye, off air, we, we are libertarians really are interested in helping people figure out what the heck is going on. And uh, part of that is a lot of new people that identify as libertarians within the last year or two, or maybe curious about the philosophy or the movement are just checking us out. And so what I want to do uh, with the Path to Libertarianism series is not only talk about the philosophy, but also talk to people who are longtime libertarians and kind of talk about their development. So you may hear yourself in some of these conversations and it may help you kind of figure out, and what the heck is going on? I have all these beliefs. I feel so alone and feel so strange. And so my, my first guest on the series is a longtime friend uh, great guy. His name is Jason Pye. Jason works at Freedom Works. What is your title at Freedom Works? Uh, I'm the Vice President of Legislative Affairs. Dang! Look at you. You're <laughs> fancy. You get to hang out with congressmen all day, don't you? Uh, not all day, but some days. I, I do get to play in a band with one of them, which is actually kind of cool. So, <laughs> so we'll, we'll we'll get to that point in your career in a little bit. Uh, I know Jason through the dreaded Brett Bittner. Uh, that is how I first met Jason. <laughs> Um, the three of us were much, much, much larger when we first met 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and, I, and I first became aware of you because of the great website, United Liberty. I used to be so jealous of that website because it was so, the, the writing was great, the brand was great, the, like, the logo was great. It was such a great website. And I went and looked at, at it recently and it was just kind of like it wasn't doing anything. So uh, you've been writing forever haven't you yeah. I mean, how did your career in politics kind of get started that, that's really it and, and think ul united liberty was uh i mean i did that website gosh for like five years ran it you know sometimes four to seven blog posts a day just writing wow. about current events and, and news and politics from a libertarian perspective and um and what, what time frame what years this was 2009 so uh, i met the guys who owned it through bob Barr's 2008 presidential campaign um and about, I don't know, six months after that campaign uh, ended, they, they contacted me and said, look, we, it's a, it was a business. These guys own a business. And they were like, we, we really want someone to run this, pay you a few hundred dollars a month just to, just to, just to write some content. Yeah, sure. No problem. And then it turned, it parlayed eventually into a full-time gig, but we'll get there. Uh, so okay. so uh, let, let's go back to the beginning. Like, yeah. did, you, did you grow up in a political household? Like where, where did your interest in politics get started? So sort of, I mean, my, my parents, uh, my mom was really the political influence in the house. She was uh, a very like Reagan Republican. Um, my father, uh, he voted, but he was I mean, he once voted for uh, Zell Miller because he shook his hand. Zell Miller was the governor of Georgia for two terms, a Democrat. He was a Southern Democrat. He eventually became a senator as a Democrat. but And, and famously he, supported Bush in Iraq, right? Right, yeah, famously did. And, and famously endorsed Bush in 2004 when Bush was up for re-election. Uh, Zell, I think, I think passed away not, not too long ago. A couple but, a year or yeah, two. Yeah, something like that. But, um, you know, so my, my, my father was, you know, he voted for Max Cleland because Max Cleland was Cleland was a, a, a Vietnam veteran. My father was a Vietnam veteran, and um, uh, Cleland famously lost re-election in two thousand two as he was a senator uh, for um, uh, for voting against home, the Department of Homeland Security because he wanted it to be unionized. And there was an ad that Saxby Chambliss ran against him uh, with the imagery of Osama bin Laden. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, it was pretty, pretty brutal stuff. Um, and, uh, but no, my, my mom was the real political influence. My father passed away in 1993. Um, he died from cirrhosis of the liver cause. Well, the actual cause of death was renal failure, but it was caused by the cirrhosis of the liver. And, um, that influenced me pretty heavily. Um, as, as a 12 year old, uh, hmm. uh you know, something that, um, uh, I think really kind of created that skepticism of government because my father was exposed to Agent Orange in Vietnam, and that's mm -hmm. ultimately what led to the, the what caused the cirrhosis. My father didn't drink. Uh, I never saw him drink at all, and, and especially when I was old enough to remember things like that, I never saw him drink. Um, so it was just my mom and I uh, after September of 1993, and um, she worked 
actually volunteered in a local campaign. I think in 1996, she worked on, uh, like, volunteer for Phil Graham's campaign locally. Uh, we grew up just south of Atlanta. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it, I think my, my hometown was actually Jonesboro, Georgia, for those of you who've heard of Gone with the Wind. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, and I, I started developing political opinions around that time. Um, sort of, you know, very conservative, um, very conservative opinions. My mom always told me um, when I was a kid that when I was, when I got older and was old enough to really un, un, like listen to talk radio and understand a little bit more about politics, that I would love Neil Bortz. Um, yes. That's the first person where I, I that's the yeah. first person where I heard the word libertarian come out of their mouths. Yes. No, exactly the same. And cause I remember um, bo- getting Neil Bortz's books for Christmas or one of his books for Christmas when I was like 18 or 17 or something like that. It was like the terrible truth about liberals. <laughs> and but he's got to say it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that one came out later, but I remember somebody has got to say it, but like, w- I got more on Bortz later. Uh, cause, <laughs> cause he, yeah, that, there's, there's a little bit of a story there. Um, that's around 2008 in the timeline. So, but I was listening to boards like when I was like, go, when I was old enough to drive to high school and I was in high school, I started listening to Neil Bortz. Like it was either that or punk rock. Like I was listening to that or like some random punk band on the way into work or on the way into school every day. And, um, you know, I mean, I just, I kept listening to, to boards, uh, started identifying as a libertarian, probably really around age 22, uh, though, like, I mean, I, I had libertarian tendencies, but I agreed with Bort. So like, if you, if you pressed me, I would have said I was a libertarian, but, um, also didn't really quite, I was re- Bo- listening, reading, listening to Bort's and reading Bort's book. I started reading other stuff. I started reading Milton Friedman. I started reading F.A. Hayek, but I just didn't really know what the label meant. Um, uh, but as time progressed, I started identifying as a libertarian, um, probably around 2000. For late 2004, I joined the Libertarian Party. I uh, was elected county party chairman at the age of 23. Mm. Um, was elected state party chairman at the age of 25. Which which year? What year? That was 2006. Okay. Um, I got elected state state party chairman. Did it for a year because I had these guys. Like I resigned after a year because these guys, a lot of the guys in the party, and Chris, you know this all too well. <laughs> that a lot of guys in the party really like to bitch about stuff. Re- they will, they will tell you everything that's wrong with what you're doing. But when it comes in, it's like, well, I have an idea to fix this, but it's going to take you know some help. So if you want to help me, uh, you know, you know, we you can I get on the phone. We can talk about it a little bit. They really didn't want to help. Oh yeah, uh, no, I was executive director of the Indiana Party, full time. Yeah, aid position from 08 to 12. That's how we, you, you, Brittner and I met. Right. And it was constant. It was a a big, big reason that I left is that I had just not done what so many people had told me they wanted me to do. Yeah. That many people were unhappy with me. And because I would say, well, I need you to step up and own this project. I mean, it is, it is, it's people who are, the, the Libertarian Party, by and large, I found to be a lot of really great people, really great friends. I, th- I think about those years all the time and how much yeah. I love those people. But there are, there are like 10% of the people that you run across that are just so foul <laughs> that you, you can't stand to be around it. It, it really did kind of suck. Well, so the, the, it's hard the, being in leadership. No, it was absolutely, absolutely was hard being in leadership, which is why I never, like, people approach me about running for, you know, LNC, you know, uh, <laughs> regional, regional representative. I was like, no, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to be in leadership anymore. Like, at the, the experience as, chair, as chairman really ruined the party for me in a lot of ways. Yeah. And because uh, you, I would go to the, our executive committee meetings and, you know, I'm 25, like, I'm, you know, I'm probably one of, if not the youngest state chair in, in the country. And I, you know, I knew what, I kind of knew what I was doing, but like also didn't have any support in the process. Right. And like, I knew how to run a business meeting. I knew how to do, uh, I knew how to do other things, but like all the, like all the real power in terms of like hiring, per, hiring personnel and all that stuff came from the vice chair, like in our, under our bylaws. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's so, it's so weird. Uh, the vice chair had all the power. And of course the vice chair at the time was, a, he was someone who was trying to, he was mentoring me as much as he could. He, he was a business guy. 
very great guy. His name's Jack Atkins. Uh, Jack was, Jack was great. Um, but there was only so much he could do with trying to run a business at the same time. Uh, so it, it was what it was. So after the, the most, the biggest controversial, like the most controversial thing I had to deal with when I was chairman was, uh, putting Bob Barr on the LNC. Mm. And, uh, at the time I didn't really know Bob that well. I had met him, uh, nice guy, knew him from the Clinton impeachment in the late nineties. Yeah, he was uh, the house manager was, of the Clinton impeachment. That's right. Right, forced to resign because he he was a congressman who found out that he was having an affair. He was no, no, no. That was Bob Livingston. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I thought Bob Barr had okay. So no. I th- I thought Barr had it as well. But no, no. So Bob, there was there was a minor little thing that came up during the impeachment scandal, which uh, I probably am not at liberty to talk about because Bob, I mean, Bob, Bob's my mentor in politics when it's all said and done. Well, then, no, yeah, no, yeah. I apologize like, to Bob Barr for besmirching his <laughs> reputation, but he, he was controversial in the party because of DOMA, the Defense of Marriage. That's correct. And Patriot Act, and yes, which, Patriot. both of which he's recanted. At least he recanted, uh, I think it was Section 2 of DOMA, which was had been used to force states or to, to kind of uh, uh, push states in the direction of banning same-sex marriage. Right. Uh, but, uh, but he, you know, he, he even wrote a piece about that, I think, after the fact, uh, after Domo was struck down. Um, but he recanted his support for the Patriot Act. He even went to work all lobby with the ACLU to, to repeal the Patriot Act mm-hmm. afterwards. But all that aside, so Bob, um, Bob was, had just left the Republican Party uh, I think he voted for Michael Bednarik in 2004, left the Republican Party in 2005, and uh, the orders came down from on high <laughs> from the from the National Party folks that Bob was to be uh, that the deal had a deal had been cut to put Bob on the LNC as a southeastern representative. So it was Alicia, Alicia Matson and I who uh, from Tennessee who were who were in charge of making it happen. We ran into some problems. Obviously, North Carolina was a, a problem for us, some people in Tennessee, but we got it done. And uh, that was the, like the final straw for me. And I was just like, I'm done here. Like, fuck it, I'm done. <laughs> like, I'm not doing this anymore. What specifically just was just like the, the catalyst? I mean, what was the... the it, 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 he was effective and they weren't? <laughs> No, it was just, it, I think for, for them, I mean, for them, if he wasn't, you know, it's the same, it's the, the, the same old libertarian argument. He is not libertarian enough. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a Republican, he'll be a Republican plant. He's going to wind up, uh, you know, setting the party back. You know, those are the, the arguments against doing it. And, you know, libertarians, like, like 95% of us do not have a personality. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like we, I keep, yeah, I, keep telling, I keep telling Jess Mears this like libertarians like if we had person like most of us don't have a personality and you know I keep telling her she's kind of like an unusual fit for the party because she has a personality um you know but like I, I would argue that it's identity there are so many people within the libertarian movement where this is the sole piece of their identity and so every every criticism of anything that they hold dear becomes a personal attack as opposed to you know I, i'm sitting next to a guy who i'm having lunch uh, if you remember ed coleman when he ran for city council the national party gave him some money and yeah. the the guy that i was having lunch with was the marion county gop chair who put out this horrendous inaccurate mailer this hit piece yeah he whipped it out showed it to me i go well now you're buying me lunch you know <laughs> it, it didn't phase me because i don't really care like it's it's being a libertarian is part of my identity. And so I just think yeah. that many people in the party, for them, it is so personal yeah. that when a Bob Barr or a Gary Johnson comes along, they feel threatened because their club is threatened, yeah. despite the fact that Gary Johnson tripled the national percentages and got tons of ballot access for, for new states, or a Bob Barr has relationships that we might not have had access to previously. Yeah. And so instead of viewing that as an asset, they view it as a threat. It's a very odd thing. Yeah, so uh, you're exactly right. I think the one thing you hit on that, and look, the, the, the problems, most of the problem that we had was from like the radical faction of the party. Right. But there were people in the radical faction of the party who I really loved and respected, like uh, Angela Keaton and Nick Sarwark and you know people like that, who I really had a lot of respect for. And 
you know, especially like th th these people were easier to, to talk to, especially because you could identify with certain issues they were working on with Angela was always like anti-war and with Nick, I mean, Nick was always concerned about process and I shared those concerns about process. Um, but anyway, so like got Bob, got Bob on the LNC. I promptly stepped down. The, uh, the vice chair became chair and I kind of just withdrew from the party for a couple of years, came back in 2008, uh, and worked for Bob Barr's presidential campaign in 2008, which, look, we had problems, <laughs> which the, the much criticized campaign. You know, Bob was, uh, Bob was, uh, played the role of candidate very well in the sense of he did not micromanage his management staff. So Russ Verney, Shane Corey, others were in charge of decisions on that campaign. Bob went along with those decisions because he understood his role was to go out and talk about the message. Right. Um, so, you know, obviously Bob didn't do as well as we had hoped. Um, be that as it may, it was a great experience. Bob, uh, I got to know Bob very well during that campaign. Uh, we became very close friends and uh, still are uh, uh, very close friends. So after that, I go back to work. I, I, I'm, I'm the legislative director of the Libertarian Party of Georgia. I, so I, four months of the year, I'm like reviewing legislation, using almost all my vacation time for my professional life to go and to, you know, talk with lawmakers and <clears throat> about not just like ballot access, but like other bills that are being introduced that, you know, that are kind of a front to libertarianism and, um, you know, stay involved in the party through, through 2012. Let me, uh, let me stop you there and let me ask you, what yeah. were you doing for a living and what was, uh, what was it about reviewing the legislation and talking to legislatures? Where did you find passion? Why were you passionate about that? No one else, no one else was doing it. Like, uh, so I was, con I was a contributor at the time. Uh, this is where I was going to take a step back. So it's kind of, it's a good question because I was going to kind of cover this anyway. Um, so one of the things that I had been doing since like 2006 2005, but 2006, I had started contributing on a blog, uh, on a blog uh, called Peach Pundit, which was like Georgia's most well-known political blog until it shut down like three, four years ago or something like that. Um, so Eric Erickson, who's now a talk show host in Metro Atlanta, uh, founder of Red State, or co-founder of Red State, um, he invited me to, to be like the libertarian voice on Peach Pundit. So I was writing about Georgia politics from that perspective. And no one, I noticed no one like really was covering what was happening in the legislature very much. So I decided to take it upon myself to do it. So, you know, I would just, you know, talk about what was happening. And that led to the creation of another website called Georgia Legislative Watch, where we were like in depth, like talking and writing about like the budget, because the budget is the biggest thing the legislature did all year long, different pieces of legislation that were coming forward. Uh, so that led me to learn how to read a bill uh, to understand uh, policy politics a little bit better in terms of like legislative policy and politics and um, uh, yeah and so that kind of was like natural for me to <clears throat> me to um, take that role inside the libertarian party to still be active and contribute in some way even though it wasn't a paid thing or anything like that uh, because my day job I was working in uh, mostly like life insurance uh, <laughs> so like I was licensed uh, actually I was licensed until the end of 2018 in Georgia for uh, life and health. Uh, then I, I let my license lapse. I figured I didn't need it anymore because uh, <laughs> I had changed careers. Um, so, but, you know, Peach Pundit led to, and the bar campaign led to United Liberty, which you mentioned earlier, and which was a passion project by, owned by a company um, that did all the web development work for Ron Paul's campaign in 2008, the web development for Bob Barr's campaign in 2008, um, I think they did some stuff for the LP too. I think they did their website. What was it? Terra Firma? Was that no, the... Terra Eclipse? Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. So, um, in 2012, they offered me a full time job that was uh, uh, based in DC. So, I quit my job in the insurance industry and took this job in DC. And um, uh, it was initially like a full time in DC thing, but like, you know, we weren't in a position suffering from the fallout that was the 2007, 2008 financial crisis. Uh, we weren't in a position to sell our home. 
we right. lost we lost a lot of our value at our house. So I was basically going to work in DC for two weeks and then coming home uh, every other weekend, and that you know started taking a little bit of a toll so on my marriage. And so I ended up just moving home and working from home full time. So and I come up to DC every you know either every month or every couple months, whatever the case may be. Uh, September 2014, they. And this, again, just to note, I didn't even know, I actually thought United Liberty, you mentioned you went on there not too long ago. I thought the website like died. Nah, no, it still exists. It's, I tra- it's not updated, yeah. I tried to go on there because I was writing something not too long ago. And I'm like, I knew I, I've known, I knew I wrote about this before. I just can't, I think it was United Liberty. So I tried to go into United Liberty to find it and like do a Google site search and couldn't find, like when I click on a link, it was like dead. Couldn't connect uh-huh. the server. And I was like, okay, well, that's, that's fine. I wrote, you know, I probably wrote a thousand articles for this website. That's, that's great. I can't find any of my work. Um, <laughs> and that's a tip for you young bloggers. Always get an export when you leave, oh, stop God. doing something because you will lose it. I've got all my exports rolled into like the We Are Libertarians website because I own it. I keep it, you know, so I've got all that stuff <laughs> squirreled yeah. away. You just have to or else you lose it. Yeah, truer words could not have been spoken. I mean, that's uh, there. Don't be wrong. There's a, there's some work on that website that like I would rather not. Be. It's like yeah, right. it's like when when uh because because I played music too. I mean, I I played at a punk band for six years from like the end of high school at, until I was probably like twenty three, and I still play music. And um, I go back and listen to our first couple like recordings, and I'm like, God, we had no business doing hmm. this. <laughs> so I like, remember there was a United Liberty podcast, and I tuned in. I I think I'd started yeah. Wall at that point, and I was like, This is the shit. I finally did something better than United Liberty. I was so <laughs> excited that you guys were bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> what was what was so bad about? I mean, the I mean, we were, it was it, the quality of the content was good. It was the blog talk radio, like you were on phone lines or something, and so I was Skype. Just, it was Skype. Yeah. Right. It, was, it was Skype with the call in option. Like I was paying for that. Like yeah. it was, uh, I no. offended my guest. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, it was, uh, thankfully it wasn't blog talk radio, but it wasn't much better than blog. And like we were recording and we would edit through audacity, which was like not the best platform. Either. Right. Like today you kids have garage band and all that stuff and other, other editing services. And yeah, you, you know, you guys had, I, plus I didn't, put a lot of effort into like learning about what was the best thing to have and what wasn't. No, so. Jason, I was stupid and spent money I didn't have on equipment. <laughs> because, you know, it's because I was mm. a little reckless, but I'm glad that I was. So no, I, I, mean, I remember, hold on. I remember asking my boss for a budget to, per, <laughs> to purchase like a, you know, a four track recorder to uh, or like a four track um, uh, soundboard to report, to purchase like, you know, uh, a, a Mac to purchase like all the stuff I needed to do it right. Because I knew I was, I knew the quality wasn't as good as it could have been, but I, and I wanted to do it right. But he would he, every time he told me he's like, "Well, what's your budget?" I was like, "Probably about two grand." He's like, "Yeah, no." <laughs> so, yeah, and there wasn't money, or nobody knew what a podcast was then. I mean, this was ten years ago. No, I mean, uh, this is podcast. I mean, because I remember when podcasts became a thing. Like they they were they were really big, like two thousand five for like a minute, and mm. then it kind of died. And next thing I know, like. Because I had a local podcast back in like 2005, 2006. Uh, I called it the Piecast, uh, nice. which is which is yeah, a nice play on words. But like, I did a few episodes of that and realized like the listenership wasn't there for it and just let it die. And I'm just all of a sudden podcasts become a thing again, and I'm just like, well, maybe I should relaunch one. You know, I mean, like you know, maybe, now's the time. I'm now's telling- the t- now's the time. But like, I don't have the time. For, I, I don't have the time for it. That's the sad thing. But you know. Uh, U- UL was was huge and it it parlayed into other things like you know I unfortunately um Terra Clips had to downsize a little bit so I was let go I was laid off and uh I was unemployed for all of a week when I called a friend of mine at Freedom Works and said hey do you know of any any jobs open like I was feeling sorry for myself I was sitting in my my office at home playing dashboard confessional songs uh, <laughs> being sad super emo and uh called my friend up and said, I'm looking for a job, do you know of anything? She's like, wait, you don't have a job right now? I was like, oh no, 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 I don't. So she's like, let me call you back. So she goes and talks to the, at the time, the executive vice president of Freedom Works, Adam Brandon. <clears throat> and Adam and I were friends, we knew each other. And so she calls me back, she's like, hey, Adam's gonna call you in a little bit. So Adam calls me five times that day. Uh, and by the last call, he had an offer, we had an off- agreement in principle. That's great for me to come work for Freedom Works. 
it was really cool. They, um, they, they really took care of me. I basically had, <laughs> I basically started off with like a, t- they paid me retroactively to my layoff date, which was amazing. And then said, look, you don't need to start until like the beginning of October. So you like, this was mid September. So like they said, spend your, spend two weeks, stay at home, spend two weeks, um, just kind of studying what we've been doing. You don't really have to do it. We're not asking you to write anything. We're not asking you to do anything. And then we'll fly up to DC beginning of October. So you can, first thing he's like, I think you're gonna be a morale boost, boost for the staff um, because everybody knew me, but they kind of try to keep it as big a secret as possible that I was coming on board because I was well liked and um, they wanted it to be a surprise. And um, I think the, I think somebody told everybody at some point though, because it wasn't, it wasn't as big a surprise when I walked in the door as I think Adam intended for it to be funny. Uh, yeah, but it was, uh, so I've been there ever since and uh, have w- gone up the chain at freedom works from uh, just a lowly policy analyst uh, to the VP of legislative affairs. So let me ask this uh, just kind of jumping back before we get into freedom works, because I think it's, it's an interesting organization. I've got a bunch of questions about it. Um, <laughs> How, how, I think when you're in the libertarian movement, it's a small world, so it's easy to kind of navigate. It's easy to be the 25 year old that's sort of bright and they go, let's make him chair and, yeah, you know, and to, to network. But like, where, where, where do you get off being an insurance salesman who just decides I'm going to be a blogger and be a policy analyst? And then how, how did you? turn yourself into somebody that does politics and policy analyst and what you love to do full time. I think there are a lot of people going, I'm really into libertarianism and liberty, but I don't know if I could ever make a career out of it. Like what do you attribute your transition into a full-time role to be? Is it your networking skills? Is it just that people noticed you and they said, he's bright, let's hire him. Like what, what (laughs) was it in, what made this possible for you? I think uh, you, you describe all that. And also you factor in the fact that I don't have a college degree. Um, but yeah. Cause I, 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 yeah, I dropped out after two semesters and huh. just said, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I, so I think it's, I think it's my, we talk about libertarians without a personality or, earlier. I think, I think I am. And I also think you are uh, examples of libertarians who have a personality and who can, yeah. who can work with people when they want to. Uh, and get along. And how does you. that explain Bittner? <laughs> That's a great question. I because uh, he has a personality. It's just Bittner, you know. It's, yeah, no, I, I know. Uh, it's, I, I'm God. just kidding. I'm just teasing our friend Brian. I like Morgan a lot better. No, he, no I've never met Morgan, but Bittner is going to get pissed off at me because I didn't actually answer your question. I had to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> then but, don't no, answer Brett, it. That's Brett, exactly what I want. Brett is one of my oldest friends, and I love the dude to death. And uh, Brett, if when you hear this, give Raptor a pet for me. Raptor is one of uh, actually my wife and I's dog uh, that we actually gave the Brittner Bittner after some some things that happened at home, the, uh, the dog got into a fight with one of our other dogs and it didn't mm. so well for poor Raptor. So we, <clears throat> realizing that we couldn't keep him, we gave him to, uh, to Brett. So, um, so Brett's good people and one of the, one of the nicest people I know. So, uh, one of the best people I know, certainly. Um, but, you know, back to the personality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, no, I mean, I was, I was good at networking. Uh, I, I could, I have this ability or so I've been told to talk to anyone. I can, where I can talk to literally anyone, uh, can have a conversation with anyone. Um, example of this yesterday, I went to go buy, a, a, I had to do some business with a County and, uh, I had the front desk lady ended up sitting there talking to her about our f- damn cats for like 20 minutes before I finally <laughs> said, you know, I actually got to get going. So like, uh, can, you know, can we, can we, speak, can, I've enjoyed the conversation, but I, I have to go get a meeting a friend for lunch. So, um, which was true, but, uh, anyway, so, uh, yeah, I think it's just a, a libertarian with personality who, who despite not having all the, the tools necessary and which is probably why I didn't start doing this full time until I was 32 years old or almost mm-hmm. 32 years old. Um, who put, was willing to put in the, the hard work that it takes to, to get, to get to that point. It's reading how to, uh, learning, or learning how to read a piece of legislation, uh, learning how to talk to lawmakers, learning how to, and today really learning how to talk to congressional staff. Um, 
and and also <clears throat> as much as I don't like to say say this, kind of understanding how to play the game a little bit, uh, even though I don't like playing the game, uh, but like doing the the things in politics that are necessary without screwing anybody over are necessary to do the job, um, right. which means which means understanding that sometimes you do have to make compromises and you're not always going to like the compromises that you have to make, but you are going to have to. You make. have to be deferential to people that you don't want to be deferential to because you don't yeah. respect them. Yeah. You know, there, there, I mean, there's certainly the congressional level, there are people I've had to be deferential to who I don't respect and who I don't particularly care for. Um, there are some who I would sooner, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, uh, there, there, there are offices I've had to deal with who I would just sooner never deal with again. Um, but um, most and most of that's at the staff level. I mean, there uh, most members I encounter are actually very nice and e very easy to get along with. Some aren't, uh, but most of the ones I've met with this congressional staff always. That's the. I'm sure you'll be shocked to know that a lot of congressional staffers who you encounter have their own agendas uh, <laughs> that don't always align with their boss. Uh, so, um, and like I always tell people, like even the baristas at Starbucks have their own agenda in, in DC. Um, but no, it's. You know, just getting to this point was has just been an exercise in like working sixty hours a week or working. Uh, the time I was running UL, I was working three jobs. Like I, I don't think a lot of people realize that. So I had my day job in the insurance industry. I ran United Liberty, and I was working for Congressman Barr um, or former Congressman Barr uh, at that time. Between two thousand ten and two thousand twelve, I was working for him, doing a lot of research for his the op eds he was writing. So uh, when I first started doing that, that was three a week. So, and then I had to do other things like write long form pieces for him for like SCOTUS blog and a few other things that kind of kicked my ass. And like, so I was probably putting in 80 hours a week, if not more at various points and in, in like a, between 2000, 2010 through 2012. Like I was, I had three jobs at that time. I've, so, always been, I've always been the same way. And I think it, I don't have a college degree either. And I always had the sense that I had to work people under the table because yep. I had to be, I had to work harder because I had to be more competitive because I need to network because I'm not going to get the same opportunities that others might. Yep. And I really think that the key, it, 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 I identify with your story because push through that insecurity, talk to that person you don't want to talk to, be nice to the person that you don't think you should be nice to do and do it multiple times. And so it's like, I don't know how to read a bill and then examine it. We'll yeah. just start doing it. And eventually yeah. you become an expert if you do it enough. Like I, when I started this podcast, it's like, and maybe you felt this too in the beginning, who the hell am I to be a political expert on a podcast? And a friend said to me, like, you've been executive director. You're, you're <laughs> working in politics professionally. Why would you think that you're not? Yeah. I, oh yeah. I, I still feel that way. I still feel yeah. like I can't believe people listen to me but they do and so no I mean, I mean no i you're 100 right i think for me the point where there was a point i think the i think i've already reached the pinnacle pinnacle of my career <laughs> like yeah. it's, it's kind of weird to like be 39 years old and be like you know i've already i've already done i've already reached my max like my maximum point and that was um 2018 it was uh i got invited to the white house for the, for a bill signing ceremony so I got to sit in the Oval Office and look like Trump or not, like, I, I, you know, and I, I don't think it's any secret that I don't particularly care for the guy. Um, and I didn't vote in 2016 um, because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like any of the candidates. And, and I, as much as I love and respect Gary Johnson, like I, I could not stand Bill Weld. Right. Um, and Gary, I think had done some things in his campaign that really rubbed me the wrong way. Like, come on, you don't know what Aleppo is. Right. Like, you know, <clears throat> um, no, but I got invited to the bill signing ceremony in December 2018 for the First Step Act, which that was a bill I busted my ass for. That was, I, I, I've told the story a couple when several times, but like the last six months of 2018, that bill was 55% of my lobbying activity. Hmm. I mean, I'm a lobbyist. That's what I am. That's what I do. You what, know? what did the act do for our listeners? Yeah. So the First Step Act was uh, a landmark criminal justice reform bill that, um, it was part of the, the, the original First Step Act was just prison reform, basically requiring programming inside the Bureau of Prisons, so in all federal correctional institutions, designed to reduce recidivism. You, they, each prisoner would be subject to a risk and needs assessment determining their level, their, their risk of be, becoming a repeat offender. So they would structure programming 
based on that risk assessment uh, for the prisoner, things they need to complete, be it, um, be it work skills, education, job training, uh, you know, uh, maybe Bible study would be part, I mean, wh whatever the case may be, like, but like it, the, the program is designed to be intensive where it, it gradually lowers their risk so they can earn time credits that they can cash in once they become low risk or minimal risk uh, to, to cash in to, to leave prison early. Now they're still, they're still like sent, they still have to serve out their sentence, but they can serve it out in home confinement or at a halfway house, for example. Mm -hmm. So, or under community supervision. So that was title one of the bill. Title four of the bill was the kind of landmark part of it. And the, certainly the, the recidivism reduction side was a big deal, but, and it was modeled after states that had done criminal justice reform, like Georgia, like Texas, like South Carolina, Utah. So there's like 30 something states have done stuff like this, recidivism reduction. Uh, but Title IV of the bill was uh, were sentencing reforms. So you're rolling back some excesses of the past, the war on drugs. Uh, so um, uh, like making the crack cocaine disparity retroactive or the, the reduction in the re disparity retroactive. So that came in 2010, it was the Fair Sentencing Act. It cut the disparity between crack cocaine and powder cocaine from 100 to one to 18 to one. But it wasn't made retroactive by Congress. So First Step Act made that retroactive. It was reducing uh, penalty. And a lot of people may not realize this. The, the penalty for crack cocaine was at one point 100 times worse than the penalty for powdered cocaine. You could have the same amount, but the penalty for the crack cocaine gee, would be 100 wonder times what, worse. Gee, wonder why that could be. Uh, yeah. Well, well <laughs> one, thing, one thing I want to say. Uh, the interesting thing about it is if you go and look at the legislative history of that bill, uh, about half the members of the Congressional Black Caucus voted for it. Um, Frankly. Yeah. So uh, I'll say this. The, the, the bill wasn't racist. The, uh, the outcomes had a racial disparity, mm. uh, which is why it needed to be fixed. Um, so, it, th and that got fixed. There were three other sentencing reforms in that bill. There were uh, some that reduced penalties. Uh, the, three, the three strikes if, and you're out. Like the, if you commit a, felony three t a drug felony three times, you get life. We lowered that to 20, 25 years. Um, so again, tw 25 years is more than enough. Uh, and then uh, there were a couple other sentencing reforms. One that was tied back to the story of Weldon Angelos. Uh, don't need to get into that here, but it was a guy who was given 55 years for a drug crime uh, simply because he had a firearm in his possession. He didn't brandish it. He didn't use it. He just had it. Um, so, but he was given a minim minimum of 55 years. It, it was three penalties stacked on top of each other, five, 25, 25. Um, he's now out uh, of prison. He, the, they came back in and dropped the, basically dropped the charges um, about two, two years ago, three years ago. So he's been out for, for a while. Um, and he's doing a documentary on criminal justice, cr the criminal justice system. Uh, but we fixed that, that penalty uh, to no longer allow it to be stacked. So what you're saying is if you're deferential to the right people and you play the game a little bit, you too can enact legislation that is signed by a president who decries law and order all the time. <laughs> Who's, who, talks, who, says we who says we have a violent crime problem and yet violent crime rates are the second lowest point since like 1993. Which yeah, so in 1992, I think was the peak. What does it take to get something like that done? Like what does the on the ground work look like to actually pass a bill like that? It was it was a lot of a lot of meetings, a lot of writing because we kept because we had we had we had we had opposition when the when the original first step act passed just the prison side they didn't have any of the other stuff in it. We only lost two Republicans. Uh, that was Steve King, who's a racist, like an actual racist. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, oh, his name escapes me. Well, Bill Hyzinga from I think Michigan. Uh, which kind of that one actually surprised us a little bit. And it turned out he had like a problem with one part of the bill, like a very tiny part of the bill. It didn't have anything to do with like the rest of it. It was like, it dealt with uh, federal prison industries, which is an actual thing. And um, so uh, we get it over the Senate and we had to do some response because there, like, this, there's this, there are a few people who were causing us headaches who were just writing like the first step back was going to let out all these illegal immigrants, of course, because that's, you know, they, they don't, you know, conservatives don't like brown people. Um, let me rephrase. Most conservatives don't like brown people. And um, 
Yeah, I mean, so that was, so we were writing responses about that. We were writing responses like to people who were saying child molesters are going to be let free, murderers are going to be let free, violent criminals are going to be let free. And we're just like, no, like all that stuff is expressly prohibited in the bill. Like stop, stop being stupid. Um, stop so, lying, maybe. Stop li well, yeah. Stop, we, propaganda may be the more accurate. I mean, this was, this was Jeff Sessions, like no joke. Like we found this out when we got to the Senate that Jeff Sessions, like F the DOJ was actually in this on the Senate side when we got the bill over the Senate, like the bill passed with like 300 and I think it was like 350 yay votes. Like there were Democrats who voted against it because it didn't go far enough. So we get over the Senate and um, like, of my, by the way, of my target legislators, we only lost one on the house side and that was Huizinga. Um, so we get over the Senate side, Senate side we knew was more of an uphill battle. Chuck Grassley, the chairman of then the chairman of House or Senate Judiciary wanted sentencing reform. We were we were we agreed, uh, but it was a matter of like what was in the world of the possible possible. And the White House had not yet said they were on board with sentencing. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember being in a meeting with Jared Kushner, who looked me dead in the eye and said, "We want a clean prison bill." And I responded, "Well, you will get that in the House, but you may not get that in the Senate." Meaning a clean bill, meaning what? Meaning no other, no sentencing reforms, no other, no other things attached to it. They just wanted prison reform and prison reform only. That was the recidivism reduction stuff was all they wanted, which was what the president uh, had said in the State of the Union address in, I think, February of 2018, was that he, he, he talked about prison reform. There was like a line in there about it. And um, he didn't say anything about sentencing. And, but we knew, like, we were talking, I mean, I was having... Almost, there was a point where I was talking daily with Senator Mike Lee, hmm. and just te just texting with him, just seeing like who are our targets, like who do who, like this is what we're hearing, what are you hearing, like exchanging exchanging information. Um, I was talking to other congressional staff, like again, almost daily at different points. Uh, so we we passed that bill in May of 2018. It's over the Senate, and it's like from May to August, nothing's happening, nothing's happening on on the First Step Act. Um, it's not dead. It's just not moving. Um, <clears throat> it's only mostly dead, uh, to quote a famous movie. Uh, Ted Cruz would be proud of that, by the way. Um, and he was, he was one of our, that's the really funny thing. If you go look at the pictures from the bill signing ceremony, I'm blocked in half of uh, more than half of them. And the reason I'm blocked and like you, cause there's one picture I think from AP that you can actually see me in it. Um, and I'm behind Ted Cruz. The rest of the pictures, Ted Cruz is blocking me from any camera view. <laughs> so like, but he was, his, he and his staff were actually, his staffer was one of the worst people I dealt with the entire time on this bill. Um, his staffer, Ben Sass's staff. Uh, there were a few other staff, uh, staffers I met with who were just like complete assholes about the bill. Like not understanding what it was, not really making the effort to understand what it was. Um, Anyway, so, but we, we charged forward. Finally, the White House in August, uh, the president said he was on board with, I think the, the White House actually told us in like July, late July, that they were going to be on board with sentencing. The president formally announced it in August after a, in a press conference or a, a meeting with Chairman Grassley and uh, others. We get sentencing added in, or we, we know what sentencing reforms are going to get added in. And we were, we had been, like I said, we've been advocated, advocating for a long time. There was a short time where we were just like, Maybe we're not going to get sentencing. Maybe we just have to let it go. But Grassley staff, you know, would call me up, make sure we were still on board. It's like, yeah, we're on board, but like, how much are we going to get? Like, are we going to get like, anything here? Like, does this kill the whole thing? Like, we were getting a little nervous there for a while. Uh, but to Chairman Grassley's credit, he kept forging ahead. Senator Lee did too. Senator Lee wanted the sentencing reforms added. Chairman, uh, now Judiciary uh, Chairman Graham who was an ally on this. I know a lot of libertarians don't like Lindsey Graham, and I certainly have my issues with him, but he was really good on this issue. Tim Scott was also involved. Um, uh, there were several others who, who may not have been very vocal or out, like in the, in the news talking about it, but they were involved behind the scenes. Um, the, the process, we were, we were at a point where like there were offices saying, we want to try to get this bill, our bill to, uh, dealing with the, the treatment of marijuana, states have legalized marijuana, like to ease treatment for them. And like, we were just like, look, we, we don't take a position on that issue. Like, I personally do not care. Like, right. Like, 
you know, that's where the libertarian side of me still is very much there. Like, I don't, I'm the worst libertarian in the sense that, like, I don't smoke weed. Um, <laughs> so I think it smells terrible and yeah, I, I can't stand it. Uh, but I don't give a, sh- I don't give a shit if you do it. Um, yeah. So we were just like, we were trying to dis- dissuade that kind of stuff from getting put in the bill because we didn't want to blow it up. We knew that was, that stuff would not have helped. Um, even some of the sponsors, the first step, or the advocates of first step would not have touched that. Um, so we finally get the bill to a place where we can support it. It's got prison, it's got prison reforms with some changes, more exceptions were added to, to weed out some, some offenders. Um, and that was all political in nature. It's just something you had to live with, even if you didn't like it. Cause the, the, our view was the risk assessment would always handle stuff like that. Mm-hmm. If someone was going to be high risk, if uh, the risk assessment could be tailored in a way to ensure that people who were ultimately going to be high risk never got out of prison. Um, but <clears throat> the exceptions were political <clears throat> and um, had to be put in because we were getting hammered on that stuff. And it was mainly Tom Cotton and John Kennedy, who are two of my least favorite senators. Yeah. Um, like they're right there with Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and Sheldon Whitehouse and others. And to his credit, Sheldon Whitehouse was actually very much involved in this bill and was at the bill signing ceremony. He was also a very nice guy. I'll give him that much, even though I disagree with him on so much politically. Um, but, uh, you know, go through the process. Uh, like I said, 55% of my lobbying activity, I've been working on criminal justice reform for, for at that point, four years. It's the, the first thing they gave me when I joined Freedom Works in 2014. And um, very passionate about the issue, became very knowledgeable about the issue through the process of uh, the, the predecessor bill was the Sentencing Reform and Corrections Act. And then we had First Step Act. And, um, you know, um, 87 to I think 12 was the vote in the Senate. And that was um, December of 2018 we got we knew we won when we got cloture uh because you need 60 for cloture and then you know all 12 votes we lost were republicans it would have been 88 to 12 but lindsey graham couldn't be there he was in afghanistan um but and then we go back over the house we start doing some touches in the house and they were going to put the for those of you who don't know this there are different way different, there's different treatment of a bill uh sometimes um the, the fun little secret of Congress, at least the House, is that most legislation that passed is actually not that controversial, and they pass on under the suspension of the rules. So like next week, for example, eight, there are 10 bills coming to the floor that I know of. Uh, eight of those are going to be passed under suspension of the rules, which means they either, that requires a, a three, I think 291, two-thirds vote to suspend the rules and pass. Um, or a voice vote. Um, so, and everything else, the controversial stuff comes out under a rule, uh, which either limits amendments or they have an open amendment process or they don't have any amendments at all. Uh, so there are two bills coming out next week under a rule. Um, so first step, because I was hearing about so many Republicans potentially voting no on it, um, I was like, guys, I told the White House this, like, guys, maybe we, maybe we should put this, we should tell Republican leadership to put this out under a rule. Uh, that way we know we, because ha- we know we have 218. We know we'll get almost every Democrat, if not all of them. Um, and that was a little bit of a concern too about Democrat. We were worried Democrats may vote no to not give the president a win. But once we- So saw- essentially you're going to say to the House, okay, let's open this up to amendments, which can be kind of a scary thing. No, uh, this is, no, we, we actually, so again, uh, it probably didn't. This is really hard to explain because this is like minutia and inside baseball of the House. But like the House, the House Rules Committee can take a bill <clears throat> and they can they can create a rule that it, there's open rules, there are structured rules, and there are closed rules. Open rules means any amendment can be introduced on the floor. A structured rule means only certain amendments can be considered on the floor. A closed rule means no amendments can be considered on the floor. So this was the first time in my life where I was basically telling the White House as well as some in congressional leadership. And, and House leadership, because Republicans still held the House at the time, I was like, we should bring this out under a rule, under a closed rule. And I have never said those words in my entire life, at least in my professional life. But I was like, I was openly advocating for like, let's p- put this out under, um, not under regular order, not allow amendments and just let's get it, let's get it over with. Because we know we have 218 votes, so let's just get it over with. Uh, they, they didn't whip the bill, which means count the votes, but 
they uh, they I was told that we they had the 291 to pass it, and sure enough, they did. Uh, I think the bill passed uh, again with 350 votes. We lost more Republicans this time around, including some friends, and, and that's that's always been something that's bothered me. But uh, some good friends of, of ours, especially good friends of mine on a personal level, voted no. Um, but we still got it passed. I think we lost 59 Republicans or 59 Republicans in total. I don't think any Democrats voted no. Um, and uh, bill passed, got signed into law. Um, I think I've worked on probably at this point, 20 different bills that have become law, some harder than others. And that includes the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I worked on that. But like everybody worked on that. Like, mm -hmm. But there were only a few of us who were working on the First Step Act and got it to a point where it could pass. And uh, so, you know, First Step Act will, uh, like I said, probably already reached the pinnacle of my career. That one, that bill would probably be the pinnacle of my career. There's a lot more work on criminal justice to be done. We got something tucked into the National Defense Authorization Act for 2020. Um, that um, uh, it's called the Fair Chance Act, which does, which it's geared towards government jobs and jobs specific to a federal contract. Uh, so basically uh, you cannot ask for someone's criminal history uh, before the conditional offer phase. Right. Then you can run a background check on them. And if something comes up, then you can deny them. So, so um, let me ask you this, like w w through this process, where does your personal philosophy now fall? Like how has that changed what you thought about libertarianism and politics in general, um, your ideology before this job and now after working with Congress directly? Uh, no, I, th I mean, look, I'm still very much a libertarian. Uh, I kind of, the way I caveat my, my personal political views, personal political philosophy, is I'm a, I'm a practical libertarian, dare I say a pragmatic libertarian, in the sense that <gasps> I know the, the evil pragmatic, uh, I mean, I've always been somewhat of a pragmatist, uh, even in my days in the LP, uh, I was a yeah. bit of a, pra I was a pragmatist. Um, and ultimately the, th the reason I left the LP is when it was made very clear to me that it was a club, not a, pol a serious political party. And that happened. Pause right there. Your mic is rubbing on your beard. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is my wife's fault. She's been telling me to grow it, grow it the out. Dangers of being handsome. <laughs> yeah. uh, no. So, uh, no, I mean, that's why I left the LP was because I was basically told this was a club and that they, that the problem with people like me was they, we wanted to get people elected and that's what, not what the LP is intended to do. And that person who said that became the secretary of the party the next day. And I was just like, I'm done. I'm right. done here. And uh, that's when I left the party. So that was, that was right after the convention in 2012. Um, and it just, you know, more and more I thought about less and less, less and less I thought the L that anybody in the LP was serious. So there were certainly people who were serious like you and Brett and, Stephen Gordon, a few others, God rest his soul, Gordo. Um, but when Vermin Supreme gets 44 votes, it's not that Vermin Supreme is running that makes it a joke. It's that 44 people in New voted Maine for him, voted for him. As yeah. if, as, OK, well, you're either trolling or you're serious about voting for him, which means you're not serious. And it's just like it's a bellwether moment where you just sort of go, OK, this party doesn't understand the opportunity that they have. No, they, they really don't. I mean, and it's the, and certainly, uh, I like, I consider Nick Sarwak a friend, but I think Nick, um, sarcasm and his personality don't always translate really well over the internet. Yeah, I agree. And, I think he's been a decent <laughs> chair, but I think he shoots himself in the foot a lot. I agree with that. I yeah, agree with that. It's it, wounds for no reason. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I, I, said, I like Nick a lot. I, I think, I think a lot of them, but like, you know, just the party itself, I just don't think has grown because it insists on being a purist philosophy uh, or they, they adhere to, a, they're, they're unwilling to move away into like the practical side of things. And like the practical side of things, I'm not talking about like surrendering your principles. I'm talking about you're at your own one yard line and you keep throwing hell, hell Marys down the field and you expect to get a touchdown every time football doesn't work that way. You, it's a game of inches and you have to move the ball downfield in whatever way you can. Maybe it's a four yard screen pass to your running back. Maybe it's a, you know, maybe it's two yards up the middle from your running back. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a 20 yard pass downfield. You don't get anything done when you constantly insist 
on purity. And I know Freedom Works has often been accused of being purity for profit. The fact is, first of all, I especially under especially with me running the lead shop, like we're we we are we try to be as practical as possible. Um, it, you know, if, if there's like First Step Act was not the bill I would have written. If you give me, uh, if you tell me like I have to have 218 votes in the House and 60 in the Senate to pass a criminal justice bill, if you tell me what you want, that bill would not have been it, been the bill I got, or I would have done. <clears throat> um, I would have elim eliminated all mandatory minimums. I would have, uh, you know, uh, I, I would have gone even bigger on the, the recidivism reduction side. Uh, I would have restored Pell Grants for prisoners. Uh, you know, those are things I would have, I would have restored federal parole. Those are things I would have done, but I, I, that was not the world in which I lived. So I had to, I had to be practical about it and get something done. That is what I'm paid to do is to pass legislation. I fail a lot. Absolutely. Or stop bad legislation. That's another thing I'm paid to do. And I fail a lot because politics in DC aren't easy. You always have Republicans who are going to vote with Democrats and Republicans suck anyway. So yeah. Uh, there's like there's like 40 members of Congress who I can regularly count on <laughs> to do what I want them. Well, there's 40 members of the House and probably like five in the Senate who I can regularly count on to do what I want them to do. Right. So let me ask you about Freedom Works because all right, so you came in after the Tea Party era. If you came in in like 2014, right? Yeah, so yeah. what what is Freedom Works? What does it do? I I have heard you know it's viewed with suspicion and but everything I've seen from you or Kibby or, you know, Julie Borowski worked there. I don't know if she still does. Austin yeah. Peterson, I think worked at there at one point, like they yeah. have a habit of hiring really solid libertarian people. What, what yeah. is freedom works and what do they do? So freedom works. I mean, basically we have a network of 5 million activists across the country. We trade that train them and educate them and mobilize them on issues related to the personal liberty, economic freedom, uh, and the rule of law. Um, so when you're pushing a bill through like first step act or try to stop a budget or pass tax uh, tax cuts, you mobilize them and drive messages uh, to their lawmakers, uh, urging them to support or oppose whatever you're working on. And we also do that. We also run a number of state campaigns uh, related to everything from school choice to criminal justice reform to cutting taxes to, I mean, uh, whatever the case may be, anything that comes up, we do that a lot of that state work through partnerships with, with state-based think tanks or advocacy organizations. But our bread and butter has always been grassroots activism. So we are most responsive and maybe this will shed some light to people who view us skeptically. We are responsive to our activist community. So there, our activist community is obviously very keen on Trump. So we have to be responsive to that, even though some like people like me <laughs> on staff aren't particularly fond of Trump. Um, Look, spending has grown dramatically on his watch, and I think that's worthy of criticism. Um, so, but at the same time, like the impeachment process, I think has been handled horribly by by House Democrats, and I don't think he should be convicted. Plus, it's going to tear the nation even further apart, and we're already so politically divided. Um, I think it's just it's bad timing. And I thought the Clinton impeachment was a bad idea too, especially in hindsight. Um, but that's what we do. I mean, it's. My, and my job is to be the face of the organization on Capitol Hill. And it's not a beautiful face, but I am the face of the organization. I, I, was, I was literally just figuring, how do I make that joke without really being <laughs> insulting? Uh, I, did, I did it for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at least I, hopefully I did it uh, more politely than you would have. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, Varying degrees, so you know how it is. I mean, you, you, you kind of are an asshole, but I mean, it's, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, I, but I'm your asshole. That's what... That's, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, so you, you have to balance things with an activist community that's very supportive of Trump. And we, we uh, my team especially, do take some liberties from time to time uh, supporting things like, look, I mean, we're, I have a paper coming out next week uh, that's 48 pages, I think. I think 40 of them are written by me. Uh, that talks about limiting the power of the presidency and restoring Article One and, and making sure Congress has the tools it needs to restore itself to be the first branch of government, which is what it was intended to be. To restore the separation, uh, to restore the separation of powers and ensure checks and balances, because you know, like him or not, Bob Barr had a great quote back in two thousand eight. He said, "Every president takes the the power of by uh, of his predecessor as a floor, and not a ceiling. And if we don't put a stop to that at some point in time, we're not going to have much liberty left." Right. Um, so you know, that paper again comes out, I think, on Tuesday. So I'm really excited about it. So um, 
And where where yeah. can they where can they uh, read that if they want? <laughs> if you're on my newsletter, um, you'll get first dibs. My newsletter comes out Mondays. You can go to my Twitter account, twitter.com slash pi, and you can sign up for my newsletter. It's the pen tweet at the top of that. Uh, P-Y-E, uh, P-Y-E. 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 Uh, you can click on that link at the top. It's the pen tweet there and sign up for it. Or you can um, just email me at jpy, P-Y-E, at freedomworks.org and ask me to ask for me to sign you up. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, uh, it's, I don't know. I mean, it's everything, everything we do is, is granted and, 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 um, making things better for the American people from a Liberty standpoint. Again, it's sort of, it can be pragmatic at times, depending on what we're working on. Uh, it's not always, sometimes I do let my, my libertarian colors show, uh, uh, especially like there's a surveillance bill coming out next week that Ron Wyden and Senator Steve Daines and um, Congress uh, woman, Zoe Lofgren and Congressman Warren Davidson are sponsoring. And we're going to let our libertarian colors fly on that one. But, uh, but you're right. Like Julie Borowski, Matt Kibbe, I mean, Matt's not there anymore. Austin, Julie and Matt are no longer at freedom works, but freedom works still has like a very strong libertarian presence. Uh, my staff certainly has very strong libertarian tendencies. <laughs> and uh, I hired a, I mean, two of, two of them certainly identify as constitutional conservatives uh, and have very strong libertarian tendencies. Uh, one of them is a guy by the name of Josh Withrow, and Josh uh, actually worked at Freedom Works under Kibbe with Julie and others. Uh, we just brought him back on, and Josh uh, is, I would say, I would gather say Josh is probably even more, he's more, he's more of the, the traditional libertarian than I am, uh, where he's not, he's not as pragmatic as I am, but Josh Josh is also one of the smartest people I know. Um, and I have another staffer, Luke, who just refers to himself as an anti-statist. He doesn't really identify as a conservative or libertarian, which He's I can so certainly- libertarian. You get these guys, they're so libertarian. My co-host Harry's like this, that they won't identify as libertarian. And you're just like, ugh. Just pick a thing. Just, just pick a pick a thing. Just you know, oh. be be a thing. But yeah, you know, he's he's a super smart kid. He's only twenty two, and he's, I, I I've hired like my three of my staffers are twenty four under, and they are the smartest kids I know, and certainly even smarter than most adults I've met. And uh, my my immediate deputy is a, a girl by the name of Sarah Anderson, and Sarah Sarah's twenty three, going on forty. Um, she's got a good head on her shoulders, and she's gonna be a rock star one day. Watch out! Watch her! Watch her career. Um, she and she hosts our podcasts. Uh, we have a podcast at Freedom Works that comes on Facebook uh, every Friday. So what's it called? Uh, I forgot the name. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll put it in the show notes so that people. Can, is, is it in iTunes? Is it an audio? Yeah, it, it, it is. And I it is on iTunes. Uh, it's uh, if you give me a second, I, I'm really bad with remembering stuff like that. So uh, I will. I will so go. Let dig me it. set up the last question here. I know you yeah. got to go, so I want to. But I think this is an important question. So hopefully you'll indulge me with your time. Okay. Um, so what does your ideological diet like? What What do you read? How do you research? Like, what are the things that you look at every day so you know what bills are going on? Like, if you were to give people like two or three things that really help you prepare for what you do to understand what you do, what would it be? Uh, so I'll answer that. The podcast is called Pardon the Disruption, and I can't believe I forgot that because um, we actually have a very funny intro, so people should definitely go check it out. I'm on the podcast probably twice or two or three times a month. Um, so the nature, the nature of my job has it dictates that I have to study a lot of process stuff in Congress and also learn, learn a lot of, and go back and read the congressional record and uh, a lot of stuff like that which is, which sucks, but like, it's just the nature of my job. But uh, when I was writing the article one paper, I found myself quoting um, like Elizabeth Price Foley, and, who's a, a law professor down in Florida, um, quoting the founding fathers and pulling from, I mean, I, actually in the last year, I probably spent more time reading the Federalist Papers than I ever have. Uh, writing that paper and writing other things about the you know, impeachment or the electoral college or whatever the case may be. Um, uh, still read Milton Friedman Hayek when I have opportunities to, when it's directly, directly relates. So you, you can't really read Hayek a lot when you're writing about criminal justice reform. Uh, but, uh, but no, I still, it's hard to read period. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, so generally what I'm reading, uh, what I read these days, uh, is that sort of stuff. I read the congressional, like uh, I read, um, every week I have to write this newsletter. So I talk about, you know, what's happening on the Hill. So I have to go look at the house rules committee website, see what bills are coming in for. 
But the newsletter does me an opportunity to uh, talk a little bit more about libertarian philosophy, or at least pull, pull from libertarian writers. So I read Reason. I still read a lot of stuff at Cato. Um, uh, those are the, uh, probably the two most prominent libertarian organizations uh, that produce, uh, produce content that I read regularly. So that's, I'd say that's probably pretty much it. The only, the, the main places I get my news from these days is like Politico and the Hill. I don't really don't read much else. Um, and then I don't watch cable news or listen to talk radio. I haven't listened to talk radio in 10 years and I haven't watched cable news in five. Uh, but I do watch C-SPAN. Um, because the nature of my job, you know. Um, I think if you do sort of what you do, I think you'll be, in, it's a lot of what I do for this. I mean, I try not, I, I really don't watch cable news ever. I think any form of television news is insulting to your intelligence. Talk radio is a form of propaganda by and large, yes. you know. So I, I seek out a lot of the exact same sources you do. So I, I think that's like the, the, the sugary treats. Yeah, no. <laughs> It, I mean, it, like what what it sounds like you avoid. No, I mean, I I I try I try to av avoid stuff like that as much as I can. Every now, like during the when the Sol Solomani Solomani strike happened, I did have to I tuned in the cable news because I needed yeah. to see immediately what was going on. See, I don't think C-SPAN was covering it, so I had to like turn it on, <laughs> turn it on CNN for a little bit and checked it out and see to see what was going. on. I don't watch Fox. I can't watch Fox News. I can't watch MS MSNBC. I, I usually just keep it on CNN. Um, you know, but like those are the. Those are the the main sources. I mean, I'm trying to think of other stuff because, like, even yesterday when I was writing this week's newsletter, I think a lot of this, like, especially when it relates to a piece of legislation on the floor uh, that's coming to the floor, like, there's a bill next week on the floor, and I'm not sure when you're going to run this, but there's a bill next week on the floor that is that basically deals with credit reporting of student loans. So if someone is uh, makes a payment for nine uh, for nine out of ten months consecutive months. Uh, a credit reporting agency cannot report as derogatory or delinquent or default any student loan. Like, if, so if they pay for 10 months, nine out of 10 months, and they default or go delinquent, credit reporting agency can't say, that, say, say anything about it. Uh, and this only relates to private loans. The repayment rate for private loans is like 98%. This is effectively not a problem. Now, granted, this doesn't talk about the cost of college. So writing this yesterday, I haven't pulled a good reason, reason magazine article about it, but I'm going to go try to find one probably tonight when I get home and basically link back to it. Like, yeah, as you know, Robbie so over whoever it is at reason points out, like the real problem here is the cost of college. You know, it's not, it's federal government involvement. It's a federal subsidy. That is the problem. So because the government keeps subsidizing loans, the cost of education keeps going higher. You reduce the subsidy, the cost of education is going to go down because you know, I mean, that's it. And you, that I'll, that's the kind of stuff I, I will point to, you know, reason, Cato, whatever the case may be. Um, especially like war powers, education, criminal justice, surveillance issues, like those places are always really good sources. And um, probably my favorite writer out of anybody right now is Alex Narostra, who writes a lot about immigration. So, uh, which we're dabbling right. in, we're dabbling in a little bit now, but we're not restrictionists. So yeah, he, he works for Cato. Uh, long time. All right. Well, that is the end of the program here. If people want to follow you at Shameless Self Promotion Time, what would you like uh, our listeners to do? Uh, Twitter.com slash pi, P Y E, uh, or freedomorse.org. I think slash Jason hyphen pi is my, my bio. And I think my most recent blog posts are somewhere on the right column. Or you can just do freedomorse.org and read all of our stuff. Um, you know, my stuff tends to be more about policy and process than libertarian philosophy, but I do occasionally go crazy so that's our audience they want they want yeah. the they want the hearty meal they don't want your libertarian philosophy <laughs> like tom woods for uh all right Th thanks so much for joining me i really do appreciate your time that's what tom tom woods is for speaking of people who aren't libertarians uh oh chris man. i i enjoyed it uh it's good seeing you again it's been too long so let's make that like let's let's change that going forward let's talk more often so yeah i'll be through georgia later this year so uh i'll hit you up and maybe we can grab lunch or something oh definitely definitely all right dude thanks man all right thanks take care bye-bye all right. Appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure. Um, 